Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Asylum Hill Congregational Church, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. My name is Jordan Rebholtz, and I am your minister for early life. We want you to know that our worship this morning is only what it is because each and every one of you are a part of it. You are welcome no matter where you are on your faith or life journey. So whether you are watching this from your couch or a coffee shop or you're catching this on a recording later in the week, thank you. Thank you for being with us. It is an honor to worship with you and connect with you in this way, and we pray that you and your families are safe and well in this time. As a reminder, if you have prayer requests that you want to share with us so that we can be praying for and with you, you can fill out a virtual prayer request card on our website. You can find that at ahcc.org. I also invite you in this moment to let us know who you are. We want to know who's joining us so you can grab your phone or another device or on your computer and go to our website and click where it says Sunday Worship Sign-In. And friends, we hope that you have already, but if not, we hope that you will like us on Facebook You'll follow us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this time when we are doing so many things virtually and via live stream, we want you to know what's happening. So you can check out all of our social media to stay updated on what is going on and any changes we may need to make. You can also check out past recordings of worship services or programming on our YouTube channel. Today at 1 p.m., we will be serving our weekly community meal at 1 p.m. out in the parking lot, and we have ziti and meatballs today, so we are very excited about that. So friends, if you can help, if you want to come help serve the meal, um, please join us at 12 noon to help get set up. And if you want more information about this ministry, you can contact me or Kyle Cannon um, so that we can continue doing this together. A few upcoming events. This Wednesday, January 12th at 7 p.m., we continue our monthly Zoom Bible study, Behold, I Make All Things New, led by Yale Divinity School professor Greg Mobley. So for more information about that and to register, you can visit our website. And then in a few weeks on Wednesday, the 26th, you are also invited to participate in a fun storytelling workshop on Zoom led by award-winning storyteller Jennifer Monroe. You can also register for that or find more information on our website. So today, later in the service, we will be celebrating and remembering our baptisms and the baptism of Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments and find some water. You can have it in a cup or a bowl, or it can even be a picture of your favorite body of water or your family at the beach this summer. Whatever works for you, for wherever you are, please find some water so that we can do that together later this morning. Friends, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We are so honored to have you with us and to be able to worship God together. So let us take a deep breath and center our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me in our responsive call to worship and invocation. Through every age of struggle, every era of hope, the Holy, the Holy One, One is a faithful, faithful companion. companion. God sustains us with joy and courage Praise God who promises to stay with us and whose presence is a force of life. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our ancestors and of our future prophets, we come to you today with so many things on our hearts. We know that you created this world as an act of love and created each and every one of us in your own image. We ask that you be with us and hear our prayers, not as a passive observer, but as a loving parent who only wants the best for us. God of co-creation, we pray for those of us who are embarking on new beginnings this year. May you show us how to sit for a few moments every day, remembering that whatever it is we are about to do, we are told by you that we aren't really doing any of it alone. Help us see that the process is important, not just the successes, and that peace is just as powerful as progress. Empower us to see new opportunities and possibilities, not just in the places we're planning for them to be, but also in the places where we might allow space for things to be brought to the surface as you see fit for us. And God, we pray for those of us who are finding ourselves angry at all of the things around us. May you encourage us to find the place where this rage can actually be a warming guide, helping us to name our pain, our needs, and our fear while stopping just short of burning us up. Help us discern how to acknowledge our very real feelings while also not allowing them to consume us. And God, we pray for those of us who are still daring to dream right now. May our visions of the future nudge us lovingly toward making better choices and kinder responses to when we mess up. And God, show us how to connect our hopes for the world down the road with our feet in this moment so that we can move toward the places you're calling us to go. Show us where you need us. Gracious and loving God, be with us as we try to make sense of this world and empower us to be the people you created us to be. We ask that you once again would descend on us with your spirit of unity, peace, and love. We know that you are with us even to the ends of the earth, and we thank you for sending us your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, friends, in the moments when we, once again, feel as if we are being knocked over by a tidal wave, whether it's in our families or at our jobs or just from watching the news every day, we're trying to find ways to balance being informed and staying sane. We know we have a lot of work to do. That's nothing new. The world has always needed people to do things. We as a church have always been committed to the act of loving our neighbors through different ministries and outreach opportunities. But we can't do this stuff without you. In the next few moments, I invite you to meditate on this gift of gorgeous music this morning and, and how you might be able to give, whether it is through your time, your talent, or your treasure, so that AHCC can continue to be a beacon of light in the world and to make the world look more like the kingdom of God. Let us give back to God a small portion of what has been so generously given to us.
blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts, Creator Christ and Holy. God of surprising abundance, we pray that you would take our gifts and use them to make the world a more loving place. We're honored to be a part of this mission and ask that you continue to lead us where you would have us go. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning um, come from the prophet Isaiah, and from the Gospels, from the letter of Luke. Let us hear the word of God in this time. But now, thus says the Lord, the Holy One who created you, O Jacob, the Holy One who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my sight and honored. And I love you. I give people in return for you. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I formed and made. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, beloved. With you I am well pleased. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God. Be with us as we try to make sense of your word so that we can be more loving people. Amen. So in 1995, the world received one of the greatest gifts it had ever been given. I am not talking about a medical discovery or new invention, but rather the Disney Pixar movie, Toy Story. I hope and pray that you all have seen this animated film as well as the rest of the movies in the franchise, which have spanned over two and a half decades. I was only six years old when this first film came out, so in some ways, I grew up alongside the Toy Story story. So in case it's been a while since you've seen them, I'll take a moment to refresh your memory. 
Toy Story, the original, which was the first movie to ever use fully computer-generated imagery, tells the tale of a young boy named Andy and his toys that come alive when no human is around. After Andy receives a Buzz Lightyear action figure for his birthday, Woody, a vintage cowboy doll, thinks that Andy is replacing him as his favorite toy. Struggle and conflict ensue, but the two eventually learn to live together, knowing there is enough space in Andy's heart for all of his toys. It's just such a beautiful example of family and friendship and the power of imagination. And then, friends, four years later, we received another gift in the form of Toy Story 2. And I can't even handle how the Toy Story story gets better with each sequel, but somehow it does. In Toy Story 2, Andy's a little older and seems to be outgrowing some of his beloved toys. After his mom gathers some items for a family yard sale while Andy is off at camp, Woody accidentally finds himself in a for sale box. A toy collector then steals Woody from the yard sale and the rest of the toys are determined to find and rescue their cowboy friend, leading them on an epic journey through town. Meanwhile, after being taken from his home, Woody wakes up in a strange room, so confused about where he is and what happened. Suddenly, Jessie, a cowgirl toy, appears and is so excited to meet him. She keeps repeating, it's you, it's you, it's really you. Now, Woody has never met this toy and says, What's me? As Jesse triumphantly gets the prospector toy to also come meet Woody, who is also just as excited to meet him, Woody asks, wait, how do you know me? To which the prospector in surprise replies, why, you don't know who you are, do you? In that moment, the lights come up revealing posters, lunchboxes, and other memorabilia with Woody's picture on them. He then learns that his character was a part of a very famous television show called Woody's Roundup. The discovery helps Woody to begin to piece together who he is and his place in the world. For the viewer, we now see the reason he was stolen was because the toy collector needed a Woody doll to complete his collection for it to be sold for a lot of money. In the process of cleaning him up and restoring the toy to near mint condition, the most gut-wrenching moment for me as a 10-year-old was seeing the final act of cleaning the toy included the painting of the bottom of Woody's boot, removing Andy's name and therefore disconnecting him from his kid. As the movie goes on, Jessie eventually tells Woody that she also used to have a kid, but had been abandoned and therefore had also had the name from the bottom of her boot removed too. And even as I say all of this, and I know it's just a movie, and I know these are just toys, but my eyes are beginning to water. Because even though both Woody and Jesse knew who they were, not having someone to belong to made them feel lost in the world. In the end, hashtag spoiler alert, but this movie came out in 1999, so I don't know if it actually warrants a spoiler alert, Buzz Lightyear and the rest of Andy's toys save Woody from the evil toy collector and bring him and Jesse safely back to Andy's room, just in time for him to come home from camp. 
when Andy sees his beloved cowboy doll and a new cowgirl doll, he's so excited. And in the next scene, we find them both admiring their freshly painted A-N-D-Y on the bottom of their boots. They were back to a place where they knew who they were and who they belonged to. They were back to a safe place where they knew the community had their back and someone to claim them as their own. Today on the first Sunday after Epiphany, we as a church mark and celebrate the baptism of Christ. It's probably one of the more obscure and awkward church holidays. I mean, we just celebrated God's incarnation as a little baby a few weeks ago, and now suddenly he's a full-grown adult and getting baptized by his cousin. It's a little jarring, but actually, the perfect place for us to be in this moment in time. It's such an important story that all four of the Gospels tell it in one way or another. Before Jesus does anything as teacher and healer, he hikes up his robe, scrambles down the muddy riverbank, and wades into the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Now, if you were to make a list of the world's great sea travelers, the Jewish people would be far from the top. The Vikings would be up there with their dragon ship. So would the ancient Irish braving the Hebridean Sea and their sealskin coracles. But nobody ever accused the Jewish people of trying to rule the waves. They had a sea coast, but no great desire to venture out onto the Mediterranean. Apart from the miserable experience of Jonah getting swallowed by a giant fish, the only Jewish seafaring examples we read about in the Bible are fishing boats, bobbing out on the Sea of Galilee, always in sight of land. The ancient Jewish people were a desert people. In the earliest days, nomadic herders of sheep and goats. Water, frankly, was terrifying. So John the Baptist's converts waded into the Jordan with trepidation. To lose your footing and go under the water was to flirt with death itself. Jewish baptism wasn't a necessarily serene or easy process, but it was an important one. It was a moment when you acknowledged that water is vital to all forms of life and fully lived into the promise that no matter what happened, God was with you. In many first century Jewish sects, including the one led by John, the pathway into any life of serious religious discipline leads through water. As the Israelites of old passed through the Red Sea, so any serious believer must do the same. So let's look at the text. Today's reading from the prophet Isaiah is written to those who were living in exile in Babylon. Sometimes we hear these phrases in church or in reading the Bible, and they become almost sanitized because we've heard them so much. The exiles in Babylon. But these people were living through hell, an actual disaster. Their world had been destroyed. Their friends and family were dying and their homes and livelihood had been stolen from them. They were angry, and they kept praying for it all to end, and wondering where the heck God was. They felt totally abandoned. And Isaiah hears them and acknowledges their struggle, but reminds them of the promises God made to them since the beginning of time. 
Not that everything was going to be fixed immediately, but that God was still there. The prophet writes, when you pass through the waters, those scary waters, I will be with you. I will be with you. Not over on the shore yelling out instructions to you or sending thoughts and prayers that it'll be okay. Really with us in the moments of struggle. And remember just a few weeks ago on Christmas, we remembered that God came to earth in the form of Jesus as a little baby called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. God promises to accompany us through this life in so many different ways. As creator, as sustainer, as listener, as lover, as friend. But there's a second part to this that's just as important. While God is accompanying us, we accompany each other. This means that as we encounter rough patches in life, being a part of communities means we have others to raise us up even when we can't seem to find God. Through different seasons of our lives, we pledge to walk alongside each other. There's this little story about a woman who was living through the aching pain of losing her partner to cancer. In the weeks that followed their death, she kept coming to church, but when it came time to stand and sing the hymns as a congregation, she would only stand there with the book in her hand, totally silent and eyes closed. A good friend noticed this and said, I see you're not singing, and I also know how much you love singing. Why don't you just try to join in? It'll make you feel better. I'm sorry, said the bereaved woman, but I just can't sing right now. I'm sure I will eventually, but for now I know the church is singing the hymns for me, and that's a great source of comfort. And that's actually what we do here. We gather across time and space to be a community that praises God, yes, but also to lift each other up. Each week in worship, we symbolically live out this work of being together and accompanying our neighbors through the waters of life. It can be treacherous sometimes, and we may slip a little, but if we all stick together, we can make it through. In the times when we are full of joy or emotional passion, we get to sing out into the world together. And sometimes, when we can't quite do that right now, we know the rest of the community is singing for us. So I'm like 99% sure I've already shared this next quote with you all in some context, but because it's so good and important, I'm going to share it again. So Brene Brown has a lot of wisdom when it comes to topics like vulnerability. She also has a lot to say about her experience with faith communities. She writes this about her experience with church. I went to church thinking it would be like an epidural, that it would take the pain away. But church isn't like an epidural. It's like a midwife. I thought faith would say, I'll take away the pain and discomfort. But what it ended up saying was, I'll sit with you in this. In some ways, the wisdom of Brene Brown and our scripture from the prophet Isaiah are saying the same thing. When the world feels like it's too much and you don't know if you can stay on the journey, God is there and people in your community are there to accompany you. It doesn't take the pain away. But the promise is that you're not doing any of it alone. 
baptism isn't an insurance policy that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you, but rather an invitation into a community that cares for you. Jesus entered those terrifying waters of the Jordan to be baptized by John, modeling to us that Jesus isn't just an example of a good way to live, but rather that he's willing to get in the deep end with us and stay there if we need him. Baptism is referred to as a sacrament. We as Protestants ascribe to two sacraments, communion and baptism. It is a sacramental act to be baptized or witness to others being baptized. And when you get right down to it, both of our sacraments are about community. Baptism is seen as the act that initiates us into community, and communion is about sustaining ourselves and others in community. So I feel like I need to say something about that initiation piece of baptism because it's really important for us to always tease these things out together. So baptism is publicly acknowledging something God already did. God already calls us beloved just because we exist. So when we gather to baptize a baby or whoever, it's like we're saying to God, ah, yes, this person is beloved. It's something we do as an act of love and welcoming. It is not an act of branding. It's not something that's done to us. And really, folks, as a feminist, the concept of consent is vital to how I view theology and participate in the world and church. And I've been on my own theological journey of reconciling infant baptism and consent. So if you ever need to talk about it, call me. Because what if we saw baptism not as branding, but as a loving invitation and reminder of who we are and who we belong to. And not that we belong to someone as if they're our owner, but someone who promises to be with us and care for us. In the sacrament that Jesus himself participated in, we are invited into a solidarity with each other where we can claim that we are claimed and loved by God and that everyone around us is loved and claimed by God. If the church can participate in this sacramental solidarity, I truly believe we can get through anything together. When Woody discovered who he was, when Jesse and the prospector revealed his place in the world as part of this famous television show, he began to understand more about himself. But that wasn't everything he needed. He needed to know who he belonged to. He really belonged to his kid, Andy, and the rest of Andy's toys, his community, we're there to rescue him. It's the same for us. Wherever you are on your faith journey, whether you were baptized as a baby or an adult, or that part of your story hasn't happened yet, whether your children or grandchildren are baptized, or that part of their story hasn't happened yet, you and they are so incredibly loved by God and God's community. God's name is written on the bottom of your boot. We're not doing this alone. We're here for you. If you can't sing right now, we will sing for you. That's what this is all about. Amen.
So our closing hymn this morning is actually my favorite hymn. I remember hearing it for the first time as a kid and just sobbing. So, so many of our traditional hymns um, are about God's majesty and timelessness across the ages, but this one is personal. It is written from God's perspective and is it's, it's a rock reminder that through all of the seasons of our lives, God is right there with us. As we sing this song together, I invite you to take that water I ask you to find and just touch it or splash it or pour it or look at that picture of you on the beach or your favorite lake. And remember the power of water and the beauty of baptism and that sacramental solidarity that we share as God's beloved. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you. In a blaze of light you wandered off to find where demons dwell. When you heard the wonder of the word, I was there to cheer you on. You were raised to praise the living God to whom you now belong. If you find someone to share your time and you join your hearts as one, I'll be there to make your verses rhyme from dusk till rising sun. In the middle age, of your life, not too old, no longer young. I'll be there to guide you through the night, complete what I've begun. When the evening gently closes in, and you shut your I'll be there as I have always been with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you baptized to see your life unfold. Friends, God's name is written on the bottom of your boot. It is important to know who we are, yes, but it is just as important to know who we belong to. You are loved. You belong here. We are with you. Amen.